So the off misunderstood MKS-80, is it more like a Jupiter-6 or is it more like a Jupiter-8? Let's talk about it. Hi, I'm Zach Marr from Alamo Music here in San Antonio, Texas. You can find us online at alamomusic.com. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button, turn on your notifications. This is our Alamo Sound Lab channel where we talk about all things music tech related. And today we're looking at the MKS-80 and comparing it to the Jupiter-6 and the Jupiter-8 in order to better understand all three. The MKS-80 is probably the most confusing of all the Jupiters. People often mistake it for a Jupiter-6 in a box or a Jupiter-8 in a box, and really, in my opinion, it is neither of those. Add on top of that, there are two revisions that are pretty different beasts, and you have a recipe for lots of arguments on forums about which revisions are better and whether or not it's more like a Jupiter-6 or a Jupiter-8. So today we're going to talk about each of these, talk about what's unique from a component standpoint that gives them their unique character, and also what's unique from a architecture standpoint that gives it unique playability. And we'll talk a little bit about how well, some of the downsides to each of these units and compare them to each other. So let's get started with the MKS-80. What is unique about the MKS-80? First, there are two revisions and the components are different in each. So the first, a revision four, which is the earlier revision, it has similar components to the Jupiter-6. It has the same Curtis trip, the CEM3340, I believe, and it has the same filter, an IR3109, but it's implemented differently on the Jupiter-6. You had, it was multi-timbral on the MKS-80. It is only a low-pass filter, doesn't have the high-pass or band-pass, and there's a separate high-pass filter that isn't resonant. So, it's different, um, I don't, this is an MKS revision five, which I'm gonna talk about in a sec, so I can't say, the Rev fours probably sounds closer to a Jupiter six, but the Rev five, let's talk about that now, doesn't sound anything like a Jupiter six to me personally. You can, there is overlap, but for the most part, it's pretty different. And why is that? It has different a different VCO and a different VCF. For the oscillators, it has a chip that Roland came up with for this synth alone. It wasn't used in any other synth as far as I know. It was the IR3R03. And it's very rare. If it breaks, you're up a creek or you're going to spend a lot of money to find a replacement one. Fortunately, they hold up pretty well. So, and then in the VCF, it shares the VCF with the JX10 and the JX8. It's a IR3R05. And those together, have a very different sound than the Jupiter 6. So I want to kind of dispel off the bat the notion that the MKS-80 is very, especially the Rev-5, is super similar to the Jupiter 6. It sounds very different to me personally. Where it is similar is in its architecture. It's almost identical in its architecture. It adds a few things and it is missing a few things though. So what it adds is aftertouch and um, velocity sensitivity, which is a big deal and was is almost we can take it for granted today. But that was this is the only Jupiter that has aftertouch and velocity sensitivity, which is really cool from an expressive standpoint. It doesn't have the ability to choose multiple waveforms, which you can do in the Jupiter 6. And it doesn't have the ability, it doesn't have a built-in arpeggiator. Um, it does have, on the other hand, more ability to and you can invert um, the envelopes on some of the modulation destinations, which I don't believe you can do in the Jupiter 6. So there's some more kind of small tweaking to the modulation that you can do in the MKS-80. It also has the aftertouch for the second LFO, which this has like a performance panel LFO. Really from an architecture standpoint, it's pretty similar to the Jupiter 6 minus the few things that I mentioned. What are the downsides to an MKS-80? I personally think it's not as playable as the Jupiter 6 and the Jupiter 8 as it lacks the arpeggiator and some of the buttons that are the way these two are laid out are it's pretty easy to get into dual and split mode. It's they're a little easier to kind of play on the fly in my opinion. But 
I could just not be used to the MAKS80, but to me, that's probably the biggest downside. Other than that, it's unique. It's the most affordable of these three. So I think it's a pretty fantastic piece. We'll listen to it in a bit. Now let's move on to the Jupiter 6. What's unique about the Jupiter 6? So to me, the most unique thing about the Jupiter 6 is two things. One, it's its filter, which I mentioned already is multi-timbral, and it's resonant across all three timbralities. It's got a low pass, high pass, and band pass, and you can get some really interesting tones by using that filter and pushing it to its limit. It also has um, Curtis chip oscillators, but you can ch select multiple waveforms, so you can stack waveforms, which is an other, the other really unique thing to me about the Jupiter 6 when you compare it to all the other Jupiters. Other than that, it also has uh, an arpeggiator that you can, in a split mode, you can run them in opposite directions, which is fun. It has the second LFO, and it has more modulation destinations and sources than the Jupiter 8. It shares a lot of other things with the MKS-80, a unison mode that's, that you can detune, as well as a lot of the same modulation destinations. On a tonal standpoint, it is a little bit colder, more metallic, you get st more sterile tones, but it's really great in a lot of 90s electronica. Um, similar to the SH-101 to me and the way it sounds and feels, um, the MKS-80 is, is warmer, it sounds to me more along the lines of the JX's, but with a lot of Jupiter. If a Jupiter and a JX had a baby, you'd get an MKS-80. So it's more in line with the, the traditional warmer sound of Roland, kind of beautiful tones that you get. Um, the Jupiter-6 is kind of the dark horse, ugly duckling, but very capable, very unique piece in the Jupiter line and really all of Roland's line. It's pretty unique. So that's really what to know about the Jupiter 6. Downsides to Jupiter 6, they're expensive. It also doesn't have uh, line outs for the upper and lower patches, so you can't get interesting stereo, stereo effects. You can get that with the MKS-80, and you get that in the Jupiter 8. It also is 6 voice, where the MKS-80 is 8 voice, and the Jupiter 8 is 8 voice, so you get some limitations there. We'll take a listen to it in a second as well. Let's move on to the Jupiter 8. So what is unique about the Jupiter 8? Well, one, it's an extraordinarily expensive vintage synth. It's upwards of 20K now. Last time we did a video, it was in the mid 10s. It's climbing up rapidly. Is it worth it? I don't know. Let's talk about what people love about it. The VCO is discrete, which is one of the last kind of discrete VCOs that Roland made really beautiful VCOs, and the VCF, the filter, um, is also an IR3109, but it has a two-pole and four-pole mode, and it has a high-pass non-resonant filter, and the two-pole, two four-pole implementation for the Jupiter 8 is unique in the Jupiter line as well. Jupiter 6 and the MKS-80 do not have that, and it is that combination of the discrete oscillators and the filter that give the Jupiter 8, in my opinion, its unique characteristics. And what are those unique characteristics? It's basically sheer beauty when you're playing it. It is just washes over you with every sound seems to be beautiful. It's hard to make ugly sounds. It's really pleasant to listen to. I wasn't sure in playing through all the three of these again if I would still feel that way, but Sure enough, when I got to it, I was like, oh yeah, this is why people love the Jupiter 8. Is it the most complex? Is it the most interesting tonally? I don't know if I would say that, but from just a sound standpoint and kind of a richness of tone and the sweet spots that it has, it's very pleasant to play and listen to. And I don't even know if it translates into recordings and to YouTube, but anyone that sat down in front of it and played it, you can feel and hear it. It's really a beautiful synth, and it just oozes late 70s, early 80s analog synth. I, for one, think it does deserve the title of best polyphonic analog synth of all time, maybe tied with a CS80 or a Oberheim or Prophet, but it is just a fantastic, beautiful piece of art, really, in my opinion. And the beauty, I think, comes down to its componentry, the 
oscillators and the filter and the at the time Roland was kind of in a spare no expense let's build the best polyphonic synth we can ever build and I think they succeeded so that's what makes it magical from an architecture standpoint it's the most limited of the three it's the most primitive hence why you can't get super complex tones out of it it doesn't have a second LFO in the performance section although you get a really cool kind of second LFO effect in the split and dual mode there's actually little lights that's a really nice performance feature on the lower and upper it tells you the rate the LFO is going and you can take the same patch put into stereo with the stereo outputs and have the lower and upper LFO modulate the sound and get some really neat effects you could do similar things on the MKS-80, but just the richness of the oscillators and the filter on the Jupiter-8 make that unique to it, and it's one of its strongest points. The arpeggiator is a ton of fun to use, and personally, it works so well. I don't know if it's different than in the Jupiter-6, but it's always more intuitive to me when I use the Jupiter-8 arpeggiator. That could be a completely nonsensical thing to say, but that's my perception when I use it. So let's take a listen and we'll conclude after that.
So there you have it. Pardon my playing, I'm not the best player in the world and my patches aren't the greatest, but I enjoy sound, I enjoy listening to the differences in these instruments, and so hopefully we were able to communicate some of the unique sound qualities of each of these instruments and how they're all uniquely beautiful in their own right and very different. From a cost standpoint, again, the MKS-80 is the most affordable and usually you can find it with a, its controller, the MPG-80, which I am highly advise in getting because it seems unusable to me. Otherwise, you would menu dive till your eyes fell out of your skull. It'd be painful to use. Um, you can still find them for anywhere between 3 and 4K um, as of the time of this video. And the Jupiter 6 on the, is the next most expensive, and those prices have gone between 5 and 8K as of late. And then the Jupiter 8 is the most expensive with prices between 15 and 25K in the last six months, kind of insane. From a uniqueness standpoint, they are all unique in their own way. They're really different sense, and they all have their strengths. I would say pads and strings are the strong point of the MKS-80, kind of plucky, strange, um, cross-mod tones, uh, FM, analog FM, weird weirdness. It's the strength of the Jupiter 6, um, interesting tones. And then the Jupiter 8, its strength is pretty much any sound that it makes. It's just incredibly beautiful. Although it is kind of mono-dimensional in the sound, it, it, it has a pretty broad palette, but it's, it's constrained almost in 
what you can do and, and the sweet spot, but it's very easy to stay in that sweet spot and it never gets tiring listening to it. It's almost meditative to listen to it. So from an investment standpoint, I don't know if any of these are great investments from a, a musical standpoint, but from a resale value, this one probably has the most upside. Unless this continues to climb, I can't see how, but perhaps. And the Jupiter 6, the same. I'd be surprised if it keeps climbing, but these were all fairly limited. I know that this only a couple thousand were made of the Jupiter 8 and only a couple a few more were made of the Jupiter 6, but it was still in the thousands. MKS-80, I couldn't find any information about how common they were, how rare they were. I'd love it if you knew. Please leave a comment below. But I hope this video was helpful in kind of clarifying the differences and the unique points of each of these. I'm sure I left something out. Please let me know below what I might have left out. And thank you for watching. You can find us at alamomusic.com. Please hit the subscribe button, turn your notifications. We'd love to see you here again. Thanks.